flowers, oh my gosh, I don't know how many huge boxes of flowers that were stapled all over. It was probably the largest, maybe the most difficult installation that we've done. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Nasher Museum podcast. I'm Stacy Kirby. I'm a performance and installation artist based in Durham, North Carolina, and I'm happy that you are joining us for this podcast today. I'm sitting here in the virtual world with Brad Johnson. Uh, he's the exhibition designer at the Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University. Hi, Brad. Thanks for being Thanks. here. Thank you, Stacy. It's nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you, right? And hear you. It's great. I'm excited today for everyone to get to know you a little bit and all that you do behind the scenes at the museum, because it's just so, as I said, behind the scenes. And I wanted to start off, though, by describing who I am a little bit for the listeners, and then I'll pass it on to you. So I'm a queer female, cisgendered, white-bodied person. I And to give the les- listeners a visual reference, I have brown hair, a medium build, and I have clear glasses. And I find this is a nice way to orient listeners on podcasts. Brad, will you introduce yourself a little bit and give us a visual description of yourself today? Uh, uh, Brad Johnson. I'm just your basic white guy, heterosexual, have lots of friends on all sides of the aisles, and just sitting here having a nice chat with you, Stacey. So let's dive, let's dive into your role at the Nasher and reveal what you do a bit. I, and I, I'll just, I will divulge that I have a background in art conservation. I worked formerly at the North Carolina Museum of Art um, and other museums as well. I've also exhibited and performed at the Nasher and I'm working with the Ancient American Collection and I'm on the Friends Board. So there's a lot of things that I do with the Nasher. So I'm very familiar with what Brad is doing, but I really am excited to get him to talk to you a little bit about his title of exhibition designer, Brad. Would you tell us, because that means different things at different museums. Can you tell us what exhibition designer at the Nasher really means? If, if I was at a large institution, I would be primarily focused on drawing designs for exhibitions as they come up. And I do do that here at the Nasher, but at the Nasher, many people wear many different hats. So I also work on all the installations that we do. The nice thing is, is not only do I think about where it's going to go in the show, but I'm thinking about installing it at the same time. It can mean anywhere from we'll work on a, taking down an exhibition might take about a week to take down and to pack up. And then we'll have a two week period uh, where the construction of the new walls will go up. Now, we designed the walls to fit the artwork. And so if you're familiar with our shows, you'll see that each of them is different depending on the the space, depending on the people, the, the artists. During that time, the walls are installed. We're still working behind the scenes, preparing art. Sometimes mm-hmm. we'll do some of the unpacking to prepare for it. Um, mm-hmm. I work uh, primarily with a crew of two other people. Um, are, they, Alex, they, are, they, are you? Are they the basement boys? This is what I've heard you call your, yourselves. We actually—that's not our term. And as a matter <laughs> of fact, I hadn't even heard of that till today. So, basement boys. I I guess we we do we do survive in the basement. That's where most of our work takes place. Well, that's where that's where conservators are usually put to. We're usually put in the basement as well. So I could I could relate to that. That's really funny because I was just talking to your colleagues at the Nasher and they said that you all named yourselves that and that they want you to make T-shirts. So there's a huge rallying behind this name. But if you didn't name yourself the Basement Boys, I am not going to call you that anymore. So well, well it, it's fine if you want to call us that, but. We, I, I don't know, we're just sort of like the prep crew, the art handlers, <laughs> mm-hmm. whatever. We take on different roles, and maybe at some point we are the basement boys. <laughs> uh, maybe we should embrace the basement boys. <laughs> um, the, the two other basement boys that are here are Alan Dippy and Patrick Kavaka. Mm-hmm. And without them and their dedication and hard work, it would be impossible to, to do. They're the mainstays of the museum. And whenever we're thinking about what's happening, we think of it in the terms of three of us and what assistance we need to accomplish mm-hmm. our goals. 
Yeah, it takes a lot of teamwork, doesn't it, working in museums? And um, a lot of people don't see that. And I appreciate you giving a shout out to Patrick and Alan. And um, I want I was curious a little bit, but how did you get into exhibition design? Uh, what was your path? Were you like born with a desire to be an exhibition designer? <laughs> No, that's that's not the case. I might have been born with some design instincts because <laughs> of just like to what I like to do when I was little. But I think the the path that brought me into exhibition design was it was begun at the Ackland Museum at UNC Chapel Hill. Mm-hmm. And I was taking an art history class and they had posted a bulletin of needing some help. Mm. And so I just answered it. I I needed to make some extra money and I answered it and started working there mm. at the Ackland. And one thing led to another. I ended up working there full time. And as people progressed and moved on to other things, I was sort of left in charge at a certain point. <laughs> I was going to ask you, how long have you worked at the Nasher at this point? At the Nasher, I've been at the Nasher, at the at Duke, I've been here over 20 years, but I was also at the Ackland for 20 years. It's been a, a while, so I have to think hard to go back that far. <laughs> it's funny, I, I do know you, but also I'm learning so many things about you right now. For example, that how our UNC Chapel Hill roots kind of cross. Like I got exposed to art as a studio artist and also conservation when I was at UNC Chapel Hill as a student. And then you're diving into exhibition design, you know, uh, through the Ackland at UNC Chapel Hill. So I love how that intersection of our of our past histories. It's really, really great. You talked a little bit about like what your day to day looks like, but can you run us through and I know every day is probably different for you. Um, that's the way my days roll too. every day is not the same. You're not just sitting in your office designing exhibitions and dreaming up Brunswick stew recipes, right? Because you're a master chef with Brunswick stew. Um, every day <laughs> is different. And I think that's what makes the job not only only challenging but fun and exciting and worthwhile is that there are many different things that make up the job. We hang a lot of different kinds of art. Some artists are better at presenting their art ready to install. Others, we have to work with them or work with their art. And so everything is problem solving, Mm -hmm. which is a huge part of the job. Mm-hmm. And and that's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to take something that has never been done before and to figure out a way to do it. Mm-hmm. You may never, ever do that again, but you had to go through that. I, I think you do a lot of that also, not only your artwork, but with some of the other challenges you have in your conservation work. So mm-hmm. that, that to me is, is one of the, the reasons that this is a, a, a wonderful job. You have a lot of um, creativity in your job. Um, you really do. Solving problems takes so much creative practice. So, um, And so I could, that's a great segue to the exhibition, uh, Reckoning and Resilience, North Carolina Art Now. Let's back up a little bit with that exhibition and talk about the timeline of putting an exhibition together. Because most people really, I find, since I do work in museums, but also am an artist uh, working with museums, most people have no idea how far out these exhibitions are planned. So can you tell Tell us like when you at the Nash or you all started planning that exhibition. Mostly it, it was on the drawing boards before the pandemic, but changes had to be made. Mm-hmm. Schedules had to be changed. And because we had more time to just talk about the show, the curators spent, I think, more time working with the, the artists virtually during the time that we were closed. So we were able to do planning in that regard. Now, the curators are the ones who, of course, selected all the art. And in this case, I think we had five curators working on this exhibition, which is quite Oof. unusual. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen. It, it is. And I'm not sure how they divided things up. But in the end, I, I think they came up with a, a very successful show with a lot of strong works in it. And mm-hmm part of the challenge was then making the art work within the space. We did a lot of that virtually as well, working with some of the plans. We did different layouts, tried to make sure we had the correct number of pieces that would fit into the space. Mm -hmm. And, And that took place a lot in behind the scenes, but two years for a show is not a huge amount of time. I mean, many shows... 
can take much longer than that. That's so true. You were talking about creative solutions, uh, or I add creative in there. It was there was there anything within the artist the North Carolina artist exhibition that you had to have a creative solution for that comes to mind? It was a little bit of a creative solution to work with the five curators because that's really about three more curators than you need. <laughs> <laughs> And it's understandable. Everybody has maybe a favorite artist or an artist they've worked with. So they they have a connection to that artist and they may want to showcase that artist. So they may feel a certain way about the way their art should be presented. So part mm-hmm. of it is making sure that everybody's heard in the mm-hmm. in the case of the five curators and to have input and to come up with a consensus on what feels right in the space. I have one specific piece that I wanted to bring up because as someone that does installation art and has worked in museums, I walk into galleries and I, you know, just like I'm sure you do, when you walk into an art exhibition, you're looking at such different things than the the, the, the typical public, right? You're looking at how things are mounted, what how things are displayed, how, what decisions they made, what they put first or second, you know, all of that, the text, the wall panels, the flow. But I was specifically looking at Elizabeth Alexander's piece, um, Mightier Work is Ahead from 2021. And these, and I know you're familiar, I'm just going to describe it for the listeners. These are pieces that are made from Confederate commemorative porcelain plates. And I noticed on her website versus in the gallery, they are presented within this white frame. And then they have a light gray paint behind the plates and they're mounted within that frame on the wall. Then there's the lighting really has an, you know, a pretty intense shadow that's happening. And that's, you know, all of that seems very intentional to me. And I was just curious, is that all the artist or is any of that you or your colleagues? Like, how did that kind of come together presenting them within this frame, et cetera, et cetera? That's a good example of when we were doing the layout and her piece. And of course, I can never take credit for any of the fine art that's in the show. The artists came up with a brilliant idea and I love those pieces. But we had been doing a layout of the pieces and we, of course, had it on a blanket in order to protect the, the objects and noticed how much better they looked on a dark background than they did on the white background. And so it was pretty easy to say, let's put this in some sort of background and, and frame it in to mm-hmm. highlight it a little bit. And so that's how that came to be in that that one example. I think that's really fascinating for people that aren't, you know, involved in art installation. Um, and actually, you know, it's very much, I think it's such a collaborative process with the curator, but with also with you and the artist holding Elizabeth's intention, you know, and knowing what, yeah, the intention of the work and then knowing what you can shift and what you can amplify and what you can support within her vision through these different materials and, and display uh, approaches and ex- exhibition approaches. So... I was really interested to have you talk about, too, the difference between in-house curated exhibitions and then traveling prepackaged exhibitions, because you and I both know those are two different worlds. So can you just share how um, how is working with an exhibition created in-house different from a traveling exhibition, say like the Ebony Patterson? The Ebony Patterson, which traveled to us and was it was an incredible (laughs) <laughs> exhibition and we worked with Ebony for weeks on the install. I mean it was so sad that <laughs> we mm-hmm. we had this wonderful show opening and then the pandemic struck and it was only seen more or less virtually after that. I think a few students might have been able to to see it. I think we were open maybe 10 days. I I can't recall exactly. To me it's actually a show that already exists is easier. I can go look at it and I can see it already installed somewhere Mm -hmm. and so i can draw on the successes that have happened at other places see the stronger works Mm -hmm. and make those choices for us or at least work Mm -hmm. with the curator to make the choices here at the at the nasher a show Mm -hmm. that we begin and has never been shown anywhere i think is more difficult I often don't see the objects until they arrive on site. So I'm working from photographs until then. And then it is a lot of the curators working to to know associations they want to make with the pieces. And we'll do a a layout that's, that's based on the images. And maybe the curator has seen most of the works 
maybe not. But then when the show arrives, we still make changes. So you have to mm-hmm. do a layout realizing that you may be making changes once it arrives. And that's nice because that way you don't have to feel that this is set in stone and it allows you to be flexible. I didn't get to see Ebony Patterson's exhibition in person. I did, you know, have seen the video, but I did hear from my cohorts that are also your cohorts that helped to install the show and that they would end the day um, covered in glitter. And I said, oh my gosh, how lucky they are to have this like magic artist dust <laughs> from installing. I mean, because her exhibition included frame drawings, tapestries, videos, videos, sculptures, installations, surfaces that were layered with what vinyl and flowers and glitter and lace and beads. Did I cover it? It was floor to ceiling wallpaper. That was a Mm. cloth wallpaper that was installed. Ah. Flowers. Oh my gosh. I don't know how many huge Mm -hmm. boxes of flowers that were stapled all over. It was probably the largest, maybe the most difficult installation that we've done. What would you say was difficult about it? And we, I just want to go ahead and say, as a disclaimer, like, you know, we are not saying that the artist work is difficult. We, you know, as people that work in museums, um, and I'm as an artist too, we support the fact that there's a level of complexity that is involved in installation art. And as museum employees, we support that and try to find ways to make that happen and support the artist's intention. So that's not reflecting on Ebony Patterson. Um, I just wanted to, to know, Brad, from you, like, what would you say was difficult for you all as a staff in terms of problem solving? In terms of problem solving, you know, working with Ebony, of course, I hadn't met her till she came here, but working with her was a pleasure. She was very, um, a comfortable person to work with. And Mm -hmm. that all went very smoothly. It was just the, the actual numbers of, uh, staff we had that we were trying to accomplish this huge endeavor within a fairly short period of time. So it was everybody show up at this time and we'll start working and we'll keep doing this every day (laughs) until we get the okay from Ebony that we feel like we've got it right. And it, it all worked out and everybody was, was, working to the same end. So you're right. It, the challenge of installing art doesn't tell you about the art itself. Seeing the art is the end result. And we could see where we were going. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was wonderful to work with her. Well, I will say I did come to the museum and someone, oh, I think it was, I think it was Kelly. We'll talk about her in a little bit. She, the registrar at the National, one of the registrars, she walked me into the gallery to show me what you all were doing. So just just so people can understand the visual, how many people at the day where you had the most people working, how many people were working in the gallery to help Ebony install this work? It was probably 10 people um, that were working and continuously. She also had a member of of her studio working with her as well. So Mm -hmm. it could have been as many as 12, but there was a lot of people and the goal is, of course, to have everybody um, working as efficiently as possible. And that that's what we were trying to to do. And so, were people people were on scissor lifts, or what? 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 What did you see when you walked in the gallery during the installation? Describe we had it a two, little bit. We had two scissor lifts because there was there were these large sort of hanging planters that were mm. installed throughout the space. The wallpaper that I mentioned before went floor to ceiling, and it had to be stapled all the way. The edges had to be stapled. There was a piece that, I don't know how many thousands of shoes that were, that's where a lot of glitter came from, um, that hung in one specific place. So several people were working just with that one piece for the installation of it. That's incredible. I'm sorry that everyone, as many people couldn't see that as you had hoped. And and I know that's in the past, but that is something that I wanted to celebrate because I know that was a huge effort on the staff and for you. The other thing I want to ask you, kind of maybe, I don't know, probably not related to that exhibition, but do you have any kind of a dangerous installation approach that you've been a part of? Is there anything that comes to mind where you're like, I'm not so sure about this? And maybe for liability reasons, we don't want to say this on the air, quote unquote, but is there anything? (laughs) Probably the scariest installation challenge we had was, this has been years ago, we we were going to do an installation of a dozen large pots by the artist uh, Mark Hewitt, who's based in Chatham County. And Sarah Schroth, who was the chief curator at the time, 
um, wanted to have a couple of the pots installed on the corners of the building so you could sort of see them from a distance. The conservator in me is just like trembling right now. <laughs> and, and of course, she asked if we could do this. And I didn't know if we could do it or not, but I, I thought we could. So, with a try, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I won't say we can't do it unless I know I've done it and it didn't work out. <laughs> So in, in this case, one of them went on a corner where we had a lot of access to. We could build a little platform, set the pot on it. It was done. It was easy. But mm-hmm. another one went right on the corner, and it was in a parapet, so we had to get up. We had a small scaffolding. People were being held by the buckles in their pants and stuff. Ooh. And Mark Hewitt himself was up on the building, and I've heard him describe it as one of the most terrifying times of his life uh, for, for working with art. And, and I know I felt the same way. That was, you know, it's one of those cases where probably in hindsight, we could have done it a little different, but in the end, they were installed and they looked wonderful. And about, I think maybe two weeks later, Duke told us we had to take them down because oh. that they were afraid they were going to fall off the building (laughs) and then like hit a person. (laughs) Right. So they were, they were afraid of that. Now they weren't going to fall off the building because these are round objects. Well, wind goes around a round object. It doesn't blow it. Mm -hmm. That's why silos are round so that the wind will go around it. So anyway, but we, we took them down for Duke. How, How were they anchored up there? They weren't anchored at all. They were sitting, they actually are heavy pots. I mean, you're familiar with Mark's large pots. They have a lot of weight to them. You know, you learn something from that process, right? You, Mm -hmm. and you said, like you said, you may not do it the same again. So I just wanted to, um, well, so every time I install my own uh, installation art, I learn something new about my own process and new materials and new approaches to installing objects. And I make new mistakes every time um, that I avoid the next time. And an example of that is for me is starting to hang clipboards (laughs) with Velcro on large MDF panels that look like fake wood paneling. And then I didn't realize I'm just giving an example here, that after I took the Velcro off, it would take the, the the faux wood grain look to it with it. So I was like, oh, well, crap, I can't reuse the wood paneling that they no longer make. And so I've had to adjust my installation techniques with my clipboards, uh, my 65 clipboards that I own. So I'm just curious, are there any mistakes on your job that you've learned from over the years that you're, or you're still learning from, I guess? A definition of what we do in general is to handle handle art safely. So we, of course, can't be attaching things to artwork in general, <laughs> we, we, unless we absolutely know that, that it's, it's safe. And in this case, you were just dealing with paneling. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's no, I'm, what I'm doing is not conservation friendly and recommended by any museum employee. No. <laughs> right. Well, we've probably done the same thing where we've attached something to a wall, but it wouldn't necessarily have been a piece of artwork. But I mean, we try and plan things out well enough ahead of time so that the safety of the staff and the art is is our primary importance when we're actually to the point of installing. I think we have the luxury of being able to plan things for a longer period of time so that we can go through different scenarios. We could try different glues. We could try different attachments. I think as an artist, your time in a way is much (laughs) more valuable than ours is trying to, to accomplish things. You have, you can't be working on something for weeks at a time. You need to make it happen where we've, (laughs) we've try and think of the scenarios ahead of time. I love that. So you're just, you're basically telling me you never make mistakes and that's so wonderful. Um, I can't tell, I can't tell you my mistakes. See, that's the difference. I got it. Some things have to stay secret. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get a little bit more serious. Of course, we've been navigating a pandemic now since 2020. And we were just talking about that in terms of Ebony Patterson show. um, And at least uh, since 2020 and here in the U.S. and 
it's it's had a huge impact on the arts. And personally, I had performances canceled. I had to deinstall an art installation without fulfilling the vision I had for the work. And I just kind of watched the pace and momentum of my career shift a bit. And I know that the Nasher had to close its doors to the public during the pandemic, um, as many arts institutions experience. So I was curious, how long did you all have to close for? And how did your job shift during the pandemic? And, and you know, what was the difficulty around that for you? Of course, we closed down like seemingly the world did. I guess that was more or less almost mid-March. And I think we had closed the Friday before the Tuesday when everything else shut down. And I wasn't allowed back into the museum until August of of that year. Mm. So those were probably, for me personally, the hardest times of just being on Zoom calls. Zoom became your, your daily connection to other people you work with. And you had to invent things and think of ways you could be a a help at work, other things you might be able to do. There was a lot of planning and changing and and rerouting and and this is what we can do if this happens. So a lot of different scenarios during Mm -hmm. that time. Yeah, it was, I mean, I think it was such a hard thing. I mean, obviously it was a hard thing and it still is in many ways, but it was just the, the not knowing right, of when you might be able to go back to work and when you might be able to let the public back in. Because you all you all didn't let the public back in when you went back to work uh, and were only open to students, right, and faculty for it a was, while. And, and by appointment only. So mm. we were trying to work as best we could within the university. And it, of course, safety was a huge concern. People really didn't know what we were up against and we were just trying to navigate it the best we could. For me, it was hard. I mean, I go to work every day and all of a sudden I wasn't going to work every day. And that was a, a, a real adjustment for someone who work is a, is a big part of my life. Yeah. And it's not just computer based. It's so physical. You're, you know, you're moving around, you're engaging with people. And like, you know, there are a lot of people that exist that way. During this period of the pandemic, we've seen a demand for arts institutions to acknowledge racial inequities that exist within our, the very of white organizations that many of them are and what role they play, kind of interrogating what role they play in the larger inequities in the arts in general. Personally, for me as an artist, I began asking these questions in regards to my own artwork before the pandemic began and before the murder of George Floyd. But my awareness has continued to expand um, in regards to the impact of my whiteness through my artwork. And for me, this is a lifelong journey that will continue to evolve. Um, and, And that said, knowing that you and I are both two white-bodied people. Our whiteness um, shows up in all aspects of what we do and how we navigate our lives. And I was just curious, like, how do you think your whiteness shows up in your exhibition design or your work at the Nasher? And have you encountered this yet in any ways that you're aware of? I haven't encountered anything directly, but I'm sure it shows up. And mm-hmm. I would love for someone to tell me if, if there are ways that, that I could be of more help and, and do things differently. The mm-hmm. way I've always approached installations is to, to, of course, work with the curators, but to work with the artists, whoever the artist is. Mm-hmm. And I want to know what they want, what they're trying to accomplish from the installation. It's an approach of working with each artist. And I would hope they would be honest with me about what they would like and if they feel like something isn't going the way it should or it, their work could look better a different way. But all I can do is work from where I am and, and grow from that as well as, as I think you've said, yeah. and and just be open because I, there's so many different ways to install exhibitions. There's no right way. There's a way that I do it primarily, but that doesn't mean it's the best way. That's just the way I, I approach it. And I'm always happy to hear what other people have to say. And that's one nice thing about going to other museums and seeing the way they do things is because you can get ideas from that. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I appreciate that honesty and that reflection. And I think, you know, as I said before, it's, and I feel the same as you, it's like staying open and to receiving that feedback um, and that insight from people that are different from you. Because I think it's just, you know, it's an important time to be developing a new level of awareness around our whiteness and sitting in any discomfort that emerges from these reflections or from feedback that we get. And I haven't always received that with an open, open mind um, in my past. And I am really working 
working on that and trying to collaborate um, with others that reflect those things back at me. So, and I also like to remind people, especially people that work in museums, like such as yourself and, and I do too, that we are all gatekeepers in some ways. And you just kind of, uh, you kind of referred to this, like we all have access to resources that many other people do not um, by working in these institutions. And what I love hearing is that you see it as a collaboration and that you're listening to the artists and you're finding ways to offer those resources to the artists. Um, and that's a huge benefit. And that's just something that we all have to keep doing from these places of power that we have within these positions that we do hold. And we do have power. And that's what you were referring to, that power dynamic of that conversation with an artist about how they want their work to be shown. I think it's great the work you're doing and, and that awareness that you have, Brad. So thank you. Speaking of people that work in museums, I know that you can't do your job alone. And you gave a shout out to two co-workers that work in the in the basement with you and in the galleries. And I'm not going to call you the B-Boys anymore. I just shortened it. Is there anybody else that you want to give a shout out to right now that you work with that often is not seen or heard in terms of exhibitions and what happens at the Nasher? Anybody else? Um, well, of course, I, I work very closely with the registrar and there are several registrars, but the our, mm-hmm. our head registrar, uh, Kelly Woolbright, um, I work very closely with her mm-hmm. and she's a pleasure to work with. I'm also... You know, happy to mention that we're married. And so I was like, come on, you got to say that you're married, Brad. Well, well, I thought you were going to say it. And then, you know, I I would follow up. One of your questions was, what was it Mm -hmm. like to to more or less work with someone you're married to? And Mm -hmm. I think this goes for a lot of things and people that we work with that if if you have respect for other people and for what they have to say, it goes a long way for whatever connection you have with them and however you're working. And I think Kelly and I can work at work together and we rarely might talk about anything at home because we're focused on the job, especially during an exhibition change. It's not the same at home. We, of course we talk about work, but we know all the characters involved and it actually is nice to be able to share with the closest person to you things that they already understand. And I hope she feels the same way about it. Well, I'll ask her next time I see her. <laughs> <laughs> and I have seen the both of you at the Nasher working and both of you at your home. And it seems like you all have figured out how to coexist in both settings. And it's pretty amazing, I have to say. Okay, so a couple of other questions. Um, I have one phone-in question, quote unquote, from Shannon Harris, who's a former exhibition designer from the North Carolina Museum of Art. I talked to her a little bit about how I was going to interview you. And she she had all these ideas of all these questions. But one of my favorite questions she posed was, what is your favorite tool? Well, I think you phrased it as what tool could I not do without? Right? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let's, okay. We'll phrase it that way. Yes. What cool, um, what tool can you not do without? I'm willing to bet you could figure this out on your own because I, I imagine you use the same tool all the time. But it's a measuring tape because Mm. you cannot, I can't do anything without it. I mean, it, it begins every piece of art, the scale of the art, how you're going to place it on the wall, the space you're going to give it. So Mm -hmm. it would be the measuring tape for me. It's pretty boring, but sorry. No, no, don't apologize. That's totally fine. That's really foundational. I love it. Uh, it. Ironically, I think because I do conservation work and then also am an artist, when I do my artwork, I really negate the tape measure. Like, I'm just like, hold it up and let me see how it looks. Let's put it there. Like, that's, <laughs> that's what I do. Besides, uh, you know, putting up wood paneling and having to measure spaces. But but yes, I would say for conservation work, um, we're over analytical and we need to know how everything is, you know, how big everything is to the nth degree. So to the inch, to the to the minute, yeah, measurement. And one other one other question. This is, this is for my dad because my dad is from Kinley and Wilson and I grew up eating. Brunswick stew. I want to know what your secret ingredient is. I would say there's not a secret ingredient. (laughs) I I would share what's in it, but the key for me is to not overcook it Mm. because you start it pretty early in the morning and you don't want it to overcook. And, And I don't mean 
um, burning it or anything. I mean, you want it to still have some semblance of vegetables and things. You don't mm-hmm. want it to be totally mush. You want it to have some substance. Mm. So yeah, so you've had this annual party at your house for how long now? This Brunswick stew gathering of arts community people. I, I've been cooking Brunswick stew since um, 1985. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Well, I was honored to be invited last uh, last round, and hopefully, I'll be invited again. But You're my dad's always welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, my dad's secret ingredient it was butter beans. I don't really think that's that secret, but you know. Anyways, <laughs> we have butter whatever. beans too. Th- those are very good in there. Let's wrap up but on a positive note because I know it's been a rough go of it. We talked about the pandemic and how that's impacted what we we both do. And so, what are you looking forward to in the next year in any part of your life? The next part of the year, I mean, for me, what I'm hoping is to be able to visit with people unencumbered by masks and to feel safe as we move forward. I won't say to get things back to normal because there is no normal anymore. Mm-hmm. I think we are where we are. But being able to to go to work on a on a regular basis and see the people you work with, see their faces and to to feel good about that that's that's what means a lot to me so i'm hoping there becomes a more familiar rhythm to life mm-hmm. and work as as we continue. That's a beautiful response. I mean, I thought you were going to say something like a vacation in Tahiti or going to <laughs> a, a brewery in Asheville or something, but but that was that was very that was beautiful, Brad. Um, it's been so fun today, Brad, to share this conversation and this virtual presence with you. Thanks for chatting with me. I just want to say I hope I see you again soon. I'm sure we will, right? Well, thank you, Stacey. I, I think you're wonderful. I think you're a natural, and I think you should just you should do a, your own podcast all the time because uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, with all my free time, right? <laughs> with all your free time, you should do your own podcast. So, but thank you very much for interviewing. You're you're excellent at it. <laughs> well, I w- I just want to thank the listeners of the podcast, and I want to encourage everyone to come to the Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University soon to check out the current exhibitions and see Brad's and the entire staff's very hard work in action. So thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.